This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For further information, or to inquire how you can volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Andy Minter. Barchester Towers by Anthony Trollope. Chapter 53. Conclusion. The end of a novel, like the end of a children's dinner party, must be made up of sweet meats and sugar plums. There is now nothing else to be told but the gala doings of Mr. Arabin's marriage, nothing more to be described than the wedding dresses, no further dialogue to be recorded than that which took place between the archdeacon who married them and Mr. Arabin and Eleanor who were married. Wilt thou have this woman to thy wedded wife? And wilt thou have this man to thy wedded husband, to live together according to God's ordinance? Mr. Arabin and Eleanor each answered, I will. We have no doubt that they will keep their promises, the more especially as the Signora Neroni had left Barchester before the ceremony was performed. Mrs. Bold had been somewhat more than two years a widow before she was married to her second husband, and little Johnny was then able, with due assistance, to walk on his own legs into the drawing-room, to receive the salutations of the assembled guests. Mr. Harding gave away the bride, the archdeacon performed the service, and the two Miss Grantleys, who were joined in their labours by other young ladies of the neighbourhood, performed the duties of bridesmaids with equal diligence and grace. Mrs. Grantly superintended the breakfast and bouquets, and Mary Bold distributed the cards and cake. The archdeacon's three sons had also come home for the occasion. The elder was great with learning, being regarded by all who knew him as a certain future double first. The second, however, bore the palm on this occasion, being resplendent in a new uniform. The third was just entering the university, and was probably the proudest of the three. But the most remarkable feature on the whole occasion was the excessive liberality of the archdeacon, he literally made presents to everybody. As Mr. Arabin had already moved out of the parsonage of St. Ewold's, that scheme of elongating the dining-room was, of course, abandoned. But he would have refurbished the whole deanery had he been allowed. He sent down a magnificent piano by Erard, gave Mr. Arabin a cob, which any dean in the land might have been proud to bestride, and made a special present to Eleanor, of a new pony-chair that had gained a prize in the exhibition. Nor did he even stay his hand here. He bought a set of cameos for his wife, and a sapphire bracelet for Miss Bold, showered pearls and work-boxes on his daughters, and to each of his sons he presented a cheque for twenty pounds. On Mr. Harding he bestowed a magnificent cello, with all the new-fashioned arrangements and expensive additions, which, on account of these novelties, that gentleman could never use with satisfaction to his audience or pleasure to himself. Those who knew the archdeacon well perfectly understood the causes of his extravagance. Twas thus that he sang his song of triumph over Mr. Slope. This was his paean, his hymn of thanksgiving, his loud oration. He had girded himself with his sword and gone forth to the war. Now he was returning from the field, laden with the spoils of the foe. The cob and the cameos, the cello and the pianoforte, were all, as it were, trophies, reft from the tent of his now conquered enemy. The Arabins, after their marriage, went abroad for a couple of months, according to the custom in such matters now duly established, and then commenced their deanery life under good auspices and nothing can be more pleasant than the present arrangement of ecclesiastical affairs in Barchester. The titular bishop never interfered, and Mrs. Proudie not often. Her sphere is more extended, more noble, and more suited to her ambition than that of a cathedral city. As long as she can do what she pleases with the diocese, she is willing to leave the dean and chapter to themselves. Mr. Slope tried his hand at subverting the old established customs of the close, and from his failure she has learnt experience. The burly chancellor and the meagre little prebendary are not teased by any application respecting Sabbath-day schools. The dean is left to his own dominions, and the intercourse between Mrs. Proudie and Mrs. Arabin is confined to a yearly dinner given by each to the other. At these dinners Dr. Grantly will not take part, 
but he never fails to ask for and receive a full account of all that Mrs. Proudie either does or says. His ecclesiastical authority has been greatly shorn since the palmy days in which he reigned supreme as mayor of the palace to his father, but nevertheless such authority as is now left to him he can enjoy without interference. He can walk down the high street of Barchester without feeling that those who see him are comparing his claims with those of Mr. Slope. The intercourse between Plumstead and the deanery is of the most constant and familiar description. Since Eleanor has been married to a clergyman, and especially to a dignitary of the church, Mrs. Grantly has found many more points of sympathy with her sister, and on a coming occasion, which is much looked forward to by all parties, she intends to spend a month or two at the deanery. She never thought of spending a month in Barchester when little Johnny Bold was born. The two sisters do not quite agree on matters of church doctrine, though their differences are of the most amicable description. Mr. Arabin's church is two degrees higher than that of Mrs. Grantly. This may seem strange to those who will remember that Eleanor was once accused of partiality to Mr. Slope, but it is no less the fact. She likes her husband's silken vest. She likes his adherence to the rubric. She specially likes the eloquent philosophy of his sermons, and she likes the red letters in her own prayer-book. It must not be presumed that she has a taste for candles, or that she is at all astray about the real presence, but she has an inkling that way. She sent a handsome subscription towards certain very heavy ecclesiastical legal expenses which have lately been occurred in Bath. Her name, of course, not appearing. She assumes a smile of gentle ridicule when the Archbishop of Canterbury is named, and she has put up a memorial window in the cathedral. Mrs. Grantly, who belongs to the High and Dry Church, the High Church as it was some fifty years since, before tracts were written, and young clergymen took upon themselves the highly meritorious duty of cleaning churches, rather laughs at her sister. She shrugs her shoulders, and tells Miss Thorne that she supposes Eleanor will have an oratory in the deanery before she has done, but she is not on that account a whit displeased. A few High Church vagaries do not, she thinks, sit amiss on the shoulders of a young dean's wife. It shows at any rate that her heart is in the subject, and it shows, moreover, that she is removed, wide as poles asunder, from that cesspool of abomination in which it was once suspected that she would wallow and grovel. Anathema Maranatha! Let anything else be held as blessed, so that that may be well cursed. Welcome kneelings and bowings, welcome matins and complins, Welcome bell, book, and candle, so that Mr. Slope's dirty surplices and ceremonial sabbaths be held in due execration. If it be essentially and absolutely necessary to choose between the two, we are inclined to agree with Mrs. Grantly that the bell, book, and candle are the lesser evil of the two. Let it, however, be understood that no such necessity is admitted in these pages. Dr. Arabin, we suppose he must have become a doctor when he became a dean, he is more moderate and less outspoken on doctrinal points than his wife, as indeed in his station it behoves him to be. He is a studious, thoughtful, hard-working man. He lives constantly at the deanery, and preaches nearly every Sunday. His time is spent sifting and editing old ecclesiastical literature, and in producing the same articles new. At Oxford he is generally regarded as the most promising clerical ornament of the age. He and his wife live together in perfect mutual confidence. There is but one secret in her bosom which he has not shared. He never yet learnt how Mr. Slope had his ears boxed. The Stanhopes soon found that Mr. Slope's power need no longer operate to keep them from the delight of their Italian villa. Before Eleanor's marriage they had all migrated back to the shores of Como. They had not been resettled long before the signora received from Mrs. Arabin a very pretty, though very short, epistle, in which she was informed of the fate of the writer. This letter was answered by another, bright, charming, and witty, as the signora's letters always were, and so ended the friendship between Eleanor and the Stanhopes. One word of Mr. Harding, and we have done. He is still presenter of Barchester, and still pastor of the little church of St. Cuthbert's, in spite of what he has so often said himself, he is not even yet an old man. He does such duties as fall to his lot well and conscientiously, 
and is thankful that he has never been tempted to assume others for which he might be less fitted. The author now leaves him in the hands of his readers, not as a hero, not as a man to be admired and talked of, not as a man who should be toasted at public dinners, and spoken of with conventional absurdity as a perfect divine, but as a good man, without guile, believing humbly in the religion which he has striven to teach, and guided by the precepts which he has striven to learn. End of chapter 53 and end of Barchester Towers by Anthony Trollope